In this talk, I'm going to share the single most important lesson I have learned from working with over 750,000 people in debt. As a debt collector, my job is to collect unpaid debt and return it to my clients who have provided a service. If you felt your walls go up the moment you heard I was a debt collector, you are certainly not alone. <laughs> The truth is, there is a negative stigma associated with debt collection. I've been in the collection industry since 1986 when my parents opened a small agency in our hometown. Ever since then, I've felt the apprehension people have whenever they hear I'm a debt collector. In 2005, after years of daily stressful phone calls, my biggest aha moment came when one day, I looked at the phone with my head in my hands and cried out loud. I just want the next person I call to be happier at the end of the call than they were at the beginning. That was the moment when happiness became my new North Star. My mission, I wanted people to feel good about paying their debt because having a debt is a psychological burden. Debt holds people back. It can hold them back when applying for a loan or a higher quality job. It can even hold them back when pursuing relationships because the reality is the stigma of debt comes with a deep feeling of shame and unworthiness. What I have learned after 30 years of collecting America's debt is that connection is currency, especially during difficult times. I certainly know what it feels like to struggle. I know what it feels like to be vulnerable in the face of hardship, and I know what it feels like to be frozen by fear. In 1992, when I was only 19 years old, I had a child, and after a healthy pregnancy, I was met with sudden tragedy. When during labor, the umbilical cord ruptured, causing lack of oxygen to my baby's brain for over five minutes. My daughter Haley was born with severe and profound brain damage, which left her blind, deaf, and on life support. During this time, I had no resources, which meant for me personally, the middle-class lifestyle I grew up in was shattered, and now I was completely dependent on the welfare system. After this tragedy, I knew what it was like to live on the other side of financial stability. I literally had Nothing. Most of the time, I was sleeping in the children's hospital and I was seeing things that you can never unsee. My daughter passed away the following year, but caring for her and being in the system, even for a short period of time, opened my eyes and influences who I am to this day. That day, I had my aha moment back in 2005. I really had no idea how I was going to make people happier by the end of the call. I knew I needed to start with reducing the enormous amount of conflict. That was actually an unveiling moment that would develop into a groundbreaking idea for me, my business, and ultimately my life. I began to research and I found an interesting study by the National Center for Biotechnology Information that found when participants were put in an MRI scanner and subjected to the word no, the punishment center of the brain was activated. This study resonated because I saw it all the time. I wondered if this could be the key to reducing conflict at my agency, so I decided to take a risky move and eliminate all negative language. In fact, the secret to my success is that I have a do not say list. The main words on the do not say list are no, not, can't, won't, however, and unfortunately. The reason we have a do not say list is because, in my experience, these negative words trigger the nervous system into its fight or flight response. Once someone feels triggered, their nervous system releases stress chemicals, cortisol and adrenaline, which immediately elevates negative feelings such as anger, confusion, and fear. 
Once that happens, no one is listening. Quite simply put, negative words plant a seed of a negative outcome. Taking a deeper dive into understanding human emotions, I found the work of David Hawkins fascinating. He found that we all have a frequency scale of emotions ranging from low to high. At the lower end of the scale, we see emotions like fear, guilt, and shame. And on the high end of the scale, we see emotions like peace, love, and joy. Have you ever dreaded a conversation, moments or even days prior to it happening, or felt your mood shift in the middle of a heated interaction? That tension you feel is you moving down the frequency scale of emotions. The do not say list was just the first part of my journey. And believe it or not, it took an incredible amount of trial and error to figure out how to replace those negative words with words that create connection. To my surprise, after eliminating negative words, the daily stress and conflict reduced. All of a sudden, there was just less grrr. And across the board, everyone was happier. My team, my clients, and most importantly, the consumers. As an extra added bonus, our revenue skyrocketed 34% in the first year alone. It's like Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Connection is currency. The next part of my journey led to three simple steps that any one of you can use right now today to build deeper connections. We don't have to make large investments to make huge change. Little shifts in communication can revolutionize the power of human connection, especially during unprecedented times. The first step is showing empathy by using a validation statement. The second step is planting a seed of happiness. And the third step is using an action statement to provide a solution. Let's explore the incredible connecting power of validation. Every one of us has a set of emotional needs, and the number one need is to feel heard and understood. It's like we have a checklist in our mind, and we can't move on in a conversation until we can check the box that we have felt heard and understood. If you've ever been speaking to someone who's stuck in a long story, repeating details over and over and ruminating on their problem, you may feel eager to jump in and tell them what they should do. If you want to build instant trust and connection, rarely does jumping in with a solution make a situation better. What makes a situation better is connection. A 2009 study in behavioral sciences and the law found that when you use empathy, what you're actually doing is creating dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and vasopressin. These are important, happy, healthy hormones that create a bond and move people up the frequency scale of emotions. In order to validate, it's important to deeply listen, which is not always easy. We need to listen to understand, listen without interruption, and most importantly, listen without judgment. A validation is not about agreeing with someone. It's simply about consciously acknowledging their experience so they can check the box in their mind and they can now move forward. The next time someone shares something challenging or difficult with you, explore using a validation. It's as simple as perspective taking by identifying the emotions they may be feeling and then saying, that sounds really frustrating. Anyone going through this would feel the same way. So you are not alone. According to a study by behavioral scientist Matthew Lieberman and UCLA, the reason this works so well is because labeling our emotions can actually help us process them better. Thich Nhat Hanh says in his book, The Art of Communicating, loneliness is the suffering of our time. When people feel connected, they don't feel as alone. Validation is important because it builds trust and rapport, which ultimately drives connection. 
Remember, it's how you make someone feel that makes the biggest impact. Step two is using a seed of happiness, which puts people in a more positive state of mind. All it takes is a few simple words to effectively reduce someone's fight or flight response, loosening their grip on the story, providing some hope that will open them up to ideas and solutions. When someone is so caught up in their problem, they may be feeling vulnerable and overwhelmed. The seed of happiness allows them to step out of their problem for just a second and have a sense of hope. I always say, fear drives escape and hope drives positive action. I think of the seed of happiness as just a tiny bridge that will move you from the problem to the solution. It's as simple as saying, the great news is, or you'll be happy to hear. A few years ago, I was speaking at a municipality conference about conscious communications, and a woman who was in charge of issuing parking citations asked me, what do you want me to say? I've got great news. You have a parking ticket? <laughs> I asked her, can you think of a bit of good news you can give these people? Now, she thought about it for a moment and then said, you know, there actually is an app they can download to avoid getting parking tickets in the future. And in that moment, it clicked for her. She knew she needed to focus more on the positive rather than the negative to keep her job running smoothly with fewer complaints. Planting a seed of happiness neutralizes fear and activates courage because it elevates happy hormones, moving people up the frequency scale of emotions. It brings a sense of stability to the situation and promotes willpower, which means the person you're speaking to is more likely to be open to a solution. Sometimes it's a little bridge, a few words that creates the solution an anticipatory comment that brings a sense of happiness and allows us to frame good news. In other words, positive words plant a seed of a positive outcome. Once you have planted the seed of happiness, it is now time for step three, which is to make an action statement, introducing a new perspective, making specific recommendations, or in some cases, directing them to their best next steps. The number one mistake I hear people make when communicating is telling people what they can't do instead of what they can do. I see this all the time, especially in business and customer service. No, unfortunately, our policy is. Why are we constantly telling people what we can't do? It's just so frustrating. It also drives disconnection. Tension runs higher, the conversation spins in circles, moving people down the frequency scale of emotions, resulting in damage to the relationship. The key is to talk in terms of solutions, and you can do this by asking yourself what you can do or how it can be done. You likely already have an idea in mind about what should happen. It's really all about how you frame that idea, which is as easy as saying a great solution would be or what I can do for you is. The action statement is where the magic happens because it makes your brain sweat figuring out how to use these three steps and provide the best solution. One important thing to understand is that using the word no puts the brakes on finding a solution and disconnects from the problem-solving area of the brain. Now, on the other hand, thinking in terms of solutions activates the problem-solving area and inspires new ideas you haven't thought of before. I'd like to share a 60-second story that especially warms my heart about a woman who used conscious communications to prevent herself from reacting defensively and instead respond with empathy. One day, her stepson sent her an emotional text message, blaming her for his difficult relationship with his father. She immediately felt her walls going up. And when you feel this way, that is the best time to remember these three steps because it will help you control your own emotional reaction. She knew reacting defensively would only lead to more conflict. So instead, she texts back using all three steps. 
To validate, she said she understood how much he must be hurting. To plant a seed of happiness, she said she'd be happy to see him and discuss how he was feeling. And she ended her text with an action statement, offering to pick him up so they could talk. She didn't get a response right away, but after a while, he called her. And for the first time in a long time, they had a healthy conversation, all because she was able to build connection. I'd like to break down why this worked for her and why it will work for you too. First, when you know ahead of time that you're going to use a validation statement, it removes the temptation to defend yourself. In this situation, she could have easily denied that his issue had anything to do with her. The problem is, when you deny someone's feelings, it immediately adds conflict, creating more layers of disconnection. Instead, she was able to check the box in his mind, making sure he felt heard and understood. Instead of saying, no, it's not my fault, she was able to bring stability and emotional safety to the situation, and in the end, focus only on what she could do. When you use conscious communications, you can transform even the most stigmatized industries. You can heal even the most damaged relationships, and you can connect with even the most difficult people to reach. I did it in debt collection. How would our world change if we saw conscious communications in healthcare, in law enforcement, in our education system? How would our everyday interactions be different if we used only three simple steps to connect with those around us? Connection is currency. So whether you apply this in your career or in your personal relationships, transforming the way you think about communication can help you in multiple areas of your life. Because remember, the most important thing is how you make someone feel. Thank you.